This series is the story of the new amphibious Arctic vehicle project named Bernard. Building on ideas, skills and questions raised during the Allen lifeboat conversion, as a team we will share all those moments needed to get Bernard up north, onto the ice and making himself useful. Well, you all will have enjoyed part one of all of the impact testing with the Tormentor. This is, of course, part two, where we have different types of uh, composites. And of course, at the end, there's going to be the finale with the candidate shell sandwich, which I'm hoping may well be what uh, Bernard ends up being built of in the not too distant future. Let's get on with it. Very well said. I'm making a modification for the second round of impact testing with new plates of different composites. The bolts through the edges, clamping the solid fiberglass frame on, were ripping out through the thinner sheets, and so I want to spread the shear force across twice as many of them. The only other solution I can think of is to over-laminate and load more fibre reinforcement around the outer edges, but hope this simpler addition will help. And so we stand ready, primed to recommence the banging. Sledgehammer ready, slow-mo cameras in place, and we'll go back to basics first. Glass fibre, famous for being cheap and the least glamorous reinforcement in the composites world and just one layer to start, so thin it's nearly transparent. In shocking news, a single layer of fiberglass can't withstand nearly 100 joules of energy applied at 12 miles an hour over a small impact area. The explanatory maths for this test is in the part one video, by the way. But, people of the channel, I'm starting to think those added clamping positions with bolts and screws through each to keep it taut aren't enough. Instead of punching a circular hole in the glass, the whole thing is violently crumpled. This means the edges are ripping out, and even the label decided to part company. By the way, those little black hairs are bristles from a super cheap laminating brush I used for this non-cosmetic work. Brushes are wastefully single-use with these resins, and so I only spend 50p on a brush. Anyway, there's the result. Obviously, single-ply glass is never going to be suitable for making anything, but I do admit I fancied seeing a hole punched neatly through. Let's double up and try again. The edges have pulled out yet again, but it's interesting to see how the failure has been focused on two vertical fractures top and bottom. And only a minor damage zone where the hammer impacted, but not enough to fracture or deform in that area. Let's see what's up with our holy ghost of our glassy trinity. Well, a slightly less dramatic version of the father and son. And you're right, that is a stray fibre of carbon that got stuck in the laminate, and not a giant brush bristle. Interestingly, all the lower holes were fine, and the ripout was all along the top. But more tellingly, the sheet has no permanent deformation. Aside from the local fractures, it's still flat as a pancake. Woven fiberglass is actually a hell of a material, not chopped strand mat, which is rubbish. Woven glass can have carbon fiber level tensile strength, and better elongation to stretch than Kevlar, and it's easy to wet out with resin, to cut, work, and repair. But it's just so dense, it's hard to make anything lightweight. Back to the destruction. This is a hybrid woven fabric. Half a negra, that stretchy tough fabric we used as the filling inside some of the part one carbon plates and half carbon fibers. Hybrids, co-mingled fabrics and mixed sandwiches all differ in behavior. It fails of course, rather as you'd expect from something with a single layer of brittle carbon and low strength negra. To be honest, across all the single ply sheets I've used, there's not a massive amount to learn. On the topic of learning though, it turns out I should learn to remove the hammer rest, masquerading as a stepladder, before release. Never mind, but a slightly compromised test for the double ply test of carbon and negra hybrid. What can we learn? The sheet does not fail catastrophically, either through puncture or linear fracture. There's a minor permanent bowing and some local damage to the area the hammer actually hit. Enegra's job is to dissipate energy, and it appears to be doing a reasonable job. Three layers of carbon Enegra hybrid now being bolted on tightly. Bang. This time, no rip out of the braced edges, and the energy is focused on the area of impact. There's a substantial fracture around the edge of the mark where the hammer made contact. Let's have it off for a closer look. There's the circle, but also a substantial crack across the middle. Compare that to the pure carbon from part one, of similar thickness. Due to the Enegro, the stiffness and strength is reduced here, but there's also a definite attempt to transfer the energy all around more equally. The broken Enegro fibers appear dry, they don't wet out like carbon or glass. My takeaway on the meaning here is at the end. Let's bring in the distinctive Aramid fiber branded as Kevlar, trademark.
<laughs> From behind, it's a warm glow, almost like an early 2000s movie colorist studio. One layer and... Now, aramid fibers are not like carbon, or like the stretchy ones like Allegra or Dialin. Kevlar is very, very approximately two-thirds of the strength and stiffness of carbon, and the fibers encapsulate in resin and they don't absorb it. It stretches about twice as far as carbon before breaking. This is why people often combine it with carbon to get a little bit more toughness, while still contributing to mechanical performance as long as not in compression. What you get in practice is crumpling rather than fractures. Now for two layers of the Kevlar. As far as I can tell, similar behaviour but just not as severe, which really should surprise no one. Alas, Kevlar isn't really a goer for projects where you might expect damage and then water ingress. Whilst Kevlar doesn't soak up resin very well, it's very water absorbent and that dampness will wick up through the laminate and never dry out. Enegra and Dialin are much more hydrophobic. There's also a lesser known fabric called Vectran. This is similar to Kevlar on the positive side of the ledger. It's similarly priced, but with fewer drawbacks. It's hydrophobic, which is a good thing, and bonds to the resin better than Kevlar. The main issue is that there's only one European consumer retailer and they barely ever have stock. Okay, for this next laminate, I've gone back to the sandwich structures we saw more of in the first episode, and I've put some Kevlar between two carbon plies, a triple ply in total. This is fascinating. A failure totally different to any we've seen in the other tests. There's the circular impact mark, but it doesn't manage a hard fracture around that line. Instead, a huge linear fracture, not held together by any surviving fibres. The Kevlar stretches by nearly 4%, double the carbon, but still breaks, being less than a third as stretchy as a Negra or Dialin. Those fibres are again looking dry and fuzzy in the middle, and we have total separation into top and bottom halves. Looking at the rear, I suppose the only noticeable thing is that the circular impact mark is not visible on the rear face of carbon. Kevlar is a weird one for me, a true compromised product. A little strong, a little stretchy, but not very anything. Let's get serious. This is my latest cord laminate candidate for the vehicle shell of Project Bernard. We have two laminates either side of a rigid 10mm PVC core foam. Each side contains unidirectional carbon fibre at 0 and 90 degree orientations, and then two layers totaling the same thickness of biaxial carbon at minus 45 and plus 45 degrees. Sandwiched in the centre of both layers is a ply of stretchy dialin, 10 plies in total and around 13 to 14 millimetres thick. We only have a light mark on the front face. From the side, an extra special angle here folks, visually at real time speed, the lama doesn't really seem to move at all. But at slow speed, sorcery happens. There is actually quite some noticeable temporary deformation. This means energy is being transferred over a period of time, which is a good thing. And evidently plenty of it is being dissipated across an area wider than the hammer. But, loyal eagle-eyed experts who have definitely not forgotten to press the channel subscribe button, you've seen the cracks in the core as the foam bends too far. They close back up as soon as it returns to shape, and still does the core's job, namely to resist compression and stop the two carbon layers from sliding over each other in shear. I repeated the impact, with some extra force courtesy of me, a few more times to see if we could cause more damage. The answer is no, not visually at least. It appears we can subject this sandwich to the force of a slow speed car crash and have it continue in service. On closer inspection, there's nothing more to report really. The core looks fine, and that little gap is only two pieces butted up against each other. On the reverse, zero evidence of the encounter, and rather unsurprisingly, no rip out of the bolt holes. We need to investigate further. There's only one quick and easy way to increase the force inflicted, and that's an actively swung sledgehammer. So I obliged. I'm afraid that was a chunk of the other end of the long-suffering table randomly breaking free. To think, that table was found on the balcony of the apartment I moved into in my mid-twenties. I wasn't seeing dramatic results, so tried the edges, where the laminate isn't supported by the material surrounding the hammer impact zone. More of a test of my aim as well. So that was fairly violent, and we've still not been able to completely defeat it. I'll go into a little bit more detail now. From all of these two dozen or so impacts now, from the ones in the middle, I can only see one major indentation. 
presumably it's very slightly crushed the foam beneath. More obvious is the damage to the edges. Where I hit with about 120% of the force of the pendulum swing hammer, the foam has compressed by about a quarter, but the carbon remains bonded to the foam and looking okay. There's a slight separation from the core here, but that's possibly due to a little less epoxy resin used at the periphery. Where the foam parts were butt joined, no evidence of mischief. Yep, an interesting test, and the reverse side looks mucky but untroubled by all the hassle I'd inflicted on its neighbour. I grabbed a corner and yanked, so we could see the innards. The carbon did seem to fold more easily around the points of maximum hammer impact, and these dents are from the prongs of another hammer I was attacking it with. Inside it's what you'd expect, a random series of diagonal fractures through the core, mostly caused as I forced the separation. Good bonding of the foam to the carbon, but a mental note to not be stingy with resin, as foam to laminate bonding is critical, even if we do use some tongues of carbon through the foam to link the two sides. Some further curiosity and more destruction, this time with a sharper, more local impact. It's quite easy to punch through the carbon and Kevlar sandwich. I've noticed that carbon can inflict some of its limitations onto Kevlar when used together. Pure Kevlar does seem to crease and crumple rather than punch through in the same way. Pure thin carbon? Super easy to crack through and grab onto with the hammer claw. Carbon with Inegra sandwiched inside from part 1. The hammer seems to almost want to scratch rather than puncture, but we do get through in the end. Then an almost identical result with a single dial-in layer. With lots more dial-in, three layers in the middle, it puts up much more of a fight. I needed multiple impacts and some wrenching to get through. The three-ply hybrid of carbon and anegra wasn't too difficult to defeat, and we hold it all the way through. Stretchy additions to composites really do, to me, seem to be at their most helpful when spreading out shock and vibrations across a large area after a moderately broad or very broad blunt force. They do not make things bullet or point impact proof, as the methods in making shrapnel or bulletproof vests and helmets is altogether different, even if sharing similar materials. Food for thought. I'm going to tweak the recipe for the actual shell for Bernard, make a larger beam and then check for stiffness, deflection and then a harder final impact test. Feel free to share your observations and ideas, but not about reinforcing the perimeters of the sheets to reduce rip out. I know about that one. Bye.